video I made on statistics and League of Legends analytical content surprisingly well. Usually when I talk at a camera, it causes people to immediately close their YouTube browser, so I actually f was flattered that a lot of people enjoyed the video. So I decided to go ahead and make another one about a similar topic that I had been thinking about. And this one is about the type of analysis that I want to personally avoid because I consider it crutch analysis. And this isn't calling out anyone else in the community who might use phrases or ways of analyzing games like this. This is just particularly for me, stuff that I want to avoid because when I find myself doing this type of analysis or, or claiming that this team will win because of one of these reasons, then it just shows that I actually am lazy and haven't really thought about the topic enough, usually. And I, I haven't decided to bro break down the teams really stylistically. I haven't watched enough of odds, and I really shouldn't be talking about it. Usually when I, when I talk like this or use these types of what I refer to as my crutch analyses, I haven't actually done the due diligence to be talking about the topic. So if you ever see me uh, kind of doing this type of analysis or... I guess I should use analysis in air quotes, then you should probably call me out and tell me, Kelsey, stop talking. You obviously haven't done the work. So I'm gonna go through these real quick. There's just top three. Of course, there are other kind of crutch analysis out there that I probably do for myself, but these are kind of the big ones that I've more and more attempted to avoid as I produce more content, as I watch more games, as I kind of feel more comfortable expressing my thoughts. The first one is what I like to call results-only analysis, and this is very broad, but it's at its core just looking at the results of matches and then trying to speculate broadly based on results. And this is something that I think most people would agree is extremely lazy analysis not just me. And I, I don't really know any analysts who kind of do this on a continuous basis, but types of this analysis that I think are most obvious, it kind of comes into two categories. One is looking at regional dominance, and two is looking at previous results of a region at an international event. So let's, let's look at the first one, what I mean by regional dominance. People have more and more assumed that if a team is dominant in their region, this points to them being good more broadly on an international scale. That if you are able to just crush every team in your region, that somehow makes you able to compete with some of the top teams internationally. And I don't think that's actually realistic at all. Part of the reason why I don't think this is true is because if you look at, for example, some of the best international showings in the recent year, yes, you've had your fanatics who made it to the semifinals and completely demolished most of their opposition in their region, but you also had your Origins who equally made it to semifinals and they struggled a lot. I mean, they lost to ridiculous teams, like they lost to Rook at a couple times. There are these, and yes, Origin ended up finishing second overall in their league and things like this, but they weren't, they didn't have the dominant showing that a lot of these teams did. And if you go back to MSI, TSM, much more dominant spring showing, right? They did well at Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. They topped their league. They finally beat, you know, Cloud9 in that decisive final, right? They had beaten them before, but it, this just felt more complete. And they were really like the strong Western team, right? They had very little opposition domestically. They had done well at a previous international tournament, regardless of people what people considered to be like the legitimacy of this event. Just looking at results only, TSM looked pretty good on paper overall. So they go to MSI and they get completely trounced. And Fnatic end up doing really well. They take SK Telecom to five games, things like this. So I think that this type of regional dominance expectation doesn't really mean anything. And when people look at the LPL right now, they say, oh, Edward Gaming have beat everyone, and Royal Never Give Up have only lost to Edward Gaming, so I think China will have some really strong, I've, I've seen people make this comment, have some really strong teams at an international event, when I don't think this is realistic to say at all. I think that there are a lot of macro hangups that Chinese teams have right now. There are a whole lot of like lazy shortcuts 
sets that they use in certain parts of the game. So I don't necessarily agree that just because a team is dominant in its region that they'll necessarily do well internationally. And you have to actually do the work of watching Edward Gaming and watching Team Solo mid games and comparing them and saying, well, I think here Team Solo mid have a, have an advantage and here, you know, Edward Gaming have an advantage. When they come together, you can kind of expect these types of win conditions to come out, and as a result, I think that this this small thing will give them an edge. The other really, really lazy type of re results-based analysis is previous international results. I don't think this is actually legitimate at all. You can The only time when you can kind of factor this in is when you look at Korea, right? Because every international event, Korea just win. So it's reasonable to expect that, consistently speaking, Korea just haven't had like a poor international showing. So it's kind of something that you can consider that even if maybe they don't look as strong in certain areas right now, they'll probably be able to adapt quickly because they have a history of doing so. This type of thing is legitimate. But if you look at just, oh, well, recently at MSI, NA did well, China did well, Korea did well, so we can expect at Worlds for NA to do well, China to do well, Korea to do well. But that's frankly ridiculous because we haven't had that kind of consistency from like a, a second tier or a third tier region ever. Like uh, Counterlogic Gaming came out of nowhere after NA did the worst of the top four regions at Worlds. Right? You had China coming out of nowhere when they've had really bad international showings recently at, at Worlds and at Intel Extreme Masters Katowice. So it's just really unreasonable. And uh, of course, G2's collapse, all of the things that it was just not expected. So looking at previous international results is really ridiculous. And this is a big reason why I really want to this split commit to watching the top teams in every single region to make sure that i can comment on how they actually stack up stylistically rather than just saying well it feels like na hasn't been good ever right it, uh, that's not fair that's that's lazy kelsey don't be lazy <laughs> crutch type of analysis that I really want to avoid going forward and that I think most people in the community when they do speak intelligently about um, international tournaments or matchups they really manage to uh, at least avoid this particular one. As we go further down we become a little bit more complex. One thing I notice a lot and that I really really hate myself when I do it right okay is head-to-head -head role analysis. And speaking of this, I mean, you take two teams and you say, I think uh, team A will beat team B because team A's top laner, jungler, and mid laner are better than team B's top laner, jungler, and mid laner, even though team A's AD carry and support are worse than team B. So it, just overall, the role head to head total is better for team A. So team A will win. Now this, like, when I do this, if I do this, I. I'm talking out of my ass. Like, I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm saying, right? It's, I haven't, I just think about the players historically. Maybe I haven't watched the games, and I, I think about what people have told me about the players, and I say that this player is better than this, so therefore this will happen. And it, a lot of times it doesn't even matter. For example, if you look at Royal versus Edward Gaming, yeah. I think it's really fair to say that both of Royal solo laners are better than Edward Gaming's. That's pretty easy, you can say that. But it doesn't matter, like significantly better. So not just slightly better, but I think at the time of their matchup, I think Scout has improved a lot since then, but at the top of their matchup, I think it was safe to say that both Looper and Xiaohu were significantly better than Mao's and Scout. That doesn't matter, because neither of those teams play to their solo lanes. Neither of those teams are going to give a fuck if their solo lanes are ahead. At all. It doesn't matter. It's, it's all about like how the bottom lane plays, looking at the pathing of MLXG and Clearlove, and how they approach the bottom lane, how they think about ganking those two, like what are they going to be the, the main bottom lane takeaway champions, how do they perform in the lane swaps, like are they going to play the lane swaps, are they going to look to control the jungler, like which, which team has better jungle control, it doesn't matter for these matchups, do these teams play around the jungler? These are the questions that you have to ask. Like It matters to an extent when you say, I think you can 
do head-to-head -head role analysis to an extent, and it does matter. Because if you're talking about two teams, like I just mentioned, that play about their jungler and their AD carries, you have to think about how those roles match up. If you think about two teams that maybe don't align completely, and maybe these one team plays around their top and mid, and one team plays around their bottom lane, you have to think about how do how does the team that doesn't play around their solo laners make it so that those teams don't get punished by a uh, top lane or mid lane matchup? Like, are these are there these mechanisms in place? Uh, you have to think about the stylistic differences of the team. It's not enough to say that certain players are better because it really, really over time in League of Legends, individual player differences have mattered much less because you don't have as many players who are just going to outplay and try to solo carry the game. And there isn't enough of a, an individual skill difference. I think LS made a video about this, that it matters. And just doing that type of analysis just doesn't show any thought or any process. And when I think see people doing that, I have to stop myself from immediately criticizing them and think, okay, like why is he bringing up these matchups? Because maybe it's relevant in the context. But for me, I'd much rather explain the nuances of how these teams play um, rather than look specifically at head-to-head. -head. Because it doesn't matter. <laughs> it honestly, it just, unless you're in a situation where you're talking about like a challenger team with extremely inexperienced players against like SK Telecom, it, it really, you can't just boil a matchup down to, well, these players are better. Very rarely can you do that. So I, I really don't like doing that type of analysis and I would like to avoid ever talking like that when people ask me how um, two teams will match up. So we've gotten slightly more broad and this one is extremely broad, but it's single issue analysis. And what I mean by this is, for example, if you know that one team is better than another team in this one aspect and you tunnel vision on that and you ignore other stylistic differences between the teams and just talk about, well, this team will beat this team because their lane swaps are much better. Because you aren't accounting for other factors and other ways that this team plays to compensate for the fact that their lane swaps are not as good. You're not accounting for what the other team's strengths actually are. And I feel like there's been a lot of single issue analysis in the community a lot. And I, I want to say both the Chinese community and the Western communities have really tunneled into onto certain single issues. For Europe, I think it has been a lot about lane swaps, very much. People talk at length about the first eight minutes of the game and the lane assignments there and how you can get tempo advantage and how this can decide and dictate the entire game. And, and a lot of the time that's very true, that does decide and dictate at the time of the game. But at the same time in Europe, we're seeing that teams with early leads are winning less than in other regions like North America, for example, or yeah, North America, basically. <laughs> um, so I think that, and in Korea and China, teams with early leads don't always win. You have teams with much lower goal leads at 10 minutes winning games consistently. So I think that this is something that you can't tunnel vision on too much. You can't just focus on macro. You have to and I hate just saying macro because I, I do think there are a lot of macro components to team fighting because you have to set up with wards and a bunch of other things. But I would say that uh, what what a lot of people consider macro is opposed to team fighting. And I, I, don't, I fundamentally disagree with this type of wording, but I do think that in terms of map movement, things like this, people will, will tunnel vision on certain things, but they won't consider other aspects is even part of macro right not even worth talking about like how to set up for proper team fights how to flank in proper team fights how to uh, create opportunities to get these types of picks um, around objectives instead of the the idea of which objective should we prioritize next how should we set up our waves what tur turret should we, we prioritize i think that this this type of analysis is very uh, prior priority based analysis where you're talking about what do we do next and then like some more some team fight analysis or some jungle control type analysis is more how 
we're going to manage to secure this type of objective. So I think that these two things actually work really hand in hand. So when, when a lot of teams or a lot of commentators focus on lane swaps specifically in Europe, and you know I've, I've also done this because I do write a lot about Europe, it's, it's damaging in the same way that I think Chinese teams who focus much more on controlling jungle buffs and team fighting is damaging to China. I think it's equally equally damaging to tunnel on one issue. Um, you need to expand and become very well-rounded because you have Korean teams. They focus on team fighting. I mean, have you watched a Korean game like Samsung, Jin Air? Uh, they they team fight very well uh, from behind, and they it's it's very interesting to to see the kind of dichotomy that the West has decided to tunnel the vision on certain things that they consider macro and they consider better and Chinese teams have focused much more on like the individual skill factors um, uh, how to set up for team fights how to play like these types of CC stacking and I think that both both sides are, are damaging and people will and both sides look dismissively at the other end and say oh this is not good because they're bad at this one thing so I, I really personally, because I've seen some of these effects, like to avoid single issue analysis. I'll use another Chinese example because recently we had the LGD versus Edward gaming match and I correctly predicted that LGD can take advantage and win a game off of EDG because of the way EDG don't uh, support their top laner at all in standard lane scenarios. However, Edward Gaming made an adaptation in the subsequent games where they showed that when they lane swaps, they do lane swap, they do support their top lane and they do focus on getting their top lane ahead. So I think that um, these you need to consider, okay, yes, there's this problem, but what happens when this problem arises? How do teams adapt and how do teams change things? Anyway, I hope that this video is informative in some way. Again to recap Three types of analysis I want to avoid doing personally are results only analysis, uh, focusing on match results, very simple, straightforward, head-to-head uh, -head role analysis, this player is better than this player, therefore this team will win, and finally, single issue analysis, this team is better at lane swaps, this team is better at team fighting, therefore this team will win.